Dr. Bill Warner holds a PhD in math and physics. He's been a professor, a businessman, and an applied physicist. He now runs politicalislam.com, which attempts to explain the unique political aims of the doctrine of Islam. Dr. Warner, welcome to the Rubin Report. Delighted to be here. Well, I'm excited to talk to you because I saw you on a couple months back with my good friend Gadsad, and I thought you laid out some extremely complex and controversial issues in, uh, in, a, in a pleasant and understandable manner. And that's where a lot of this stuff gets lost, right? We don't talk about religion and particularly Islam in, in a real honest way that often, do we? Well, I try to use what I call fact-based reasoning which is a, a concept that used to be quite common, but is disappearing from the universities now. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I was just down in Florida, and a president of a local community college said that I should be censored and never allowed to speak. Of course. I was unstable. Because you were unstable, that's what they said? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I wish uh, that I didn't believe you on that, but I know enough about what's going on in the colleges to know that you're telling me the truth. So first off, let's just start a little bit with your history and what led you here. So for a man that has a PhD in math and physics, why in God's name would you get involved in religion of all things? Because I love history. And I've also, this may sound odd, I've always loved religion. I've always seen religion as one of the great civilizational forces. And so I've always been interested in history as viewed through the lens of how religion affects it. So that's what started out with my interest. Yeah. My first you, interest, however, was to actually study Sufism at age 30, which was 45 years ago. So you go from science, and basically what you've done is taken what you've learned in the field of science, and then you apply that to studying religion. Is that fair to say? That's, yes, because one of the things that's unusual about my study is, is I do a systemic study. That is, I study the, the whole thing, not just bits and pieces. And the other thing is, I'm very fond of measurement. Because once we have measurement, we have something we can talk about between us that is objective. So I'm interested in bringing as much objectivity to a study which is usually considered to be, well, it's all about feelings. But I find there's a lot to be actually known about Islam. Right. <clears throat> so you go for the difference, we talk about this all the time, the difference between fact and feeling. Fact might make you uncomfortable, but it's a, it's a better place to get true knowledge than going for feelings all the time. Well, that's what I think. Now, let me explain to you, this is sort of an odd idea more and more today. Uh, our civilization is based on, I believe, two cornerstones, an ethical cornerstone of unitary ethics, all people will be treated the same, and an intellectual cornerstone of <clears throat> fact-based reasoning, critical thought. So that's what I try to bring to the table, is what I think is the best of our, excuse me, <clears throat> is the best of our civilization, which is critical thought. Yeah, well, we certainly do need more of it. So uh, before we get right into Islam, which really is your specialty, you've studied a lot of the big religions, right? Can you tell me a little bit about sort of who you studied with, how you studied, why you studied, where you went to study, the whole shebang? Well, I started out, well, like I say, uh, studying Sufism because it was sold to me as a Western mysticism. And I was raised in a very Christian home, and so it pressed upon me the need for religion to be integrated into life. And so I thought, well, let me explore this, because remember, I'm a scientist and an applied scientist, and so I'm big on experiment, which would in my case mean actually not just reading a book, but going and trying it. So I tried Sufism, studying with a teacher for about a year, then there's some things about it that didn't line up right to me, and so I drifted away. I, for instance, oddly enough, have studied Torah at the Orthodox Synagogue here in Nashville, which is slightly unusual. Mm -hmm. I've studied Buddhism with Buddhist teachers and yoga with yoga teachers. So I've both read and practiced. Yeah. And so that's what I bring to the table. So is, I think some people watching this will say that there's an inherent disconnect between these two methodologies, right? One we know is based on belief and one is based on fact. So how are you able to combine those two schools of thought to, to even judge what is real about religion? Well, it, to me, there are three great questions in life. Who are we, why are we here, and where are we going? Now, you can be an atheist and have your own answers. As a matter of fact, I perturb atheists when I say, include them in the grand study of religion because I say, look, these are their answers to what I consider the three primary religious questions. So 
I know that some would say there's no reason at all in religion, but yet I say there is a reason in the sense of we attempt to give the answers of why are we here, and where are we going, and who are we? So I try to bring rationality to the study and also a calm tone of voice. I uh, don't like people who interrupt. I don't like people who shout at me or anything and become angry. It's like, chill out. Let's just discuss this. <laughs> And it may take a long discussion, but let's talk. Yeah, well, I think you're on the right show if that's if that's what you're going for. <laughs> uh, and that's actually why I really enjoyed your conversation with Gad, because these conversations, you know, if you watch cable news for the little bits they spend on religion or belief or whatever it is, you know, it's just these little five-minute bites and they're yelling over each other. And it's like, this is this is what we need to, to unpack some really... Uh, important stuff. So, all right. So, let's dive into Islam because your your website and really your life's work now is uh, it's politicalislam.com. So, when did you really get interested in understanding the the sort of political nature of Islam? And can you explain how that's different from the religious nature? Ah, uh, you touched on what I think is the most important subject here in discussing Islam. Islam is not a religion. Muslims will tell you it's not a religion. They will tell you it is a complete way of life. Now, I say that the same thing in another way, which is it is a complete civilizational viewpoint. So being a complete civilization, it has religion, yes. But when we read its, quote, religious documents, we discover something very odd. Over half of them are about me and probably you, that is, the kafir, the mm -hmm. unbeliever. Well, this is very unusual because most religions concern themselves on how to be, let's say if you study Torah, it's how to be a Jew. So I was really struck with this, that how much of the doctrine, and by the way, on doctrine, let's define this. Most people think the doctrine of Islam is found in the Quran, but that's only a small portion mm -hmm. of it. And the Quran itself says in 91 verses, see my measurements I there? 91 verses say that every Muslim is to follow the way of Muhammad, called the Sunnah. And that's found in two books, Hadith, the Traditions, and the uh, Sirah, his life, his mm -hmm. Bible. So when you read all of this, it's overwhelmingly concerned with, as I say myself, now then, I am not a member of the religion of Islam, so if it involves me, it is not a religious involvement. It is a political involvement, because the Sharia wants to tell me what I can say and not say, what I can do and not do. And so, let me give you an example. Sure. In, you, in Europe, it's quite common, and now that in America, we find Muslims will, on Friday, commandeer the street and pray. You go, well, that's religious. Uh, is it? The prayer is religious, but commandeering the street is a political action. And so that I'm only concerned. I don't care if they pray or don't pray. That's not a concern of mine. But commandeering my street and not being arrested, I have a problem with that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so interesting because I've gone out of my way since we've been talking about these topics since this show started in September. I always try to separate the, the average person of any religion who believes anything they want in the privacy of their own home and doesn't, as long as you don't chop someone's head off, as long as you don't impose your belief, I don't care what you do. It, I, I don't think, I'm not trying to tell you how to live, and as long as you don't tell me how to live, then I think we're good to go. But so there is where you're making the interesting distinction. It's not about the prayer itself, it's about the other actions that start sort of leaking into society. Yes. Like on 9-11, it had a religious motivation, but I tell you, when you take a guided missile, whether it's guided with a computer chip or a human brain, and plow it into it, economic targets, that is a political action to me. Yeah. So therefore, I judge it on a political basis, which, by the way, I don't like the politics. <laughs> See, that's something else I can say. I have no opinion about the religion, but let me be very clear. I do not like political Islam. Why? because how it treats me and people like me. And then people say, oh, you're a bigot, you're a hater, you're a racist, you're Islamophobe. Wait a minute, why is it when I talk about how what I don't want done to me, I'm a racist, Islamophobe, bigot, hater? I don't get this. Well, also that term, Islamophobia, a phobia is a fear, is an irrational fear of something. But as you just laid out quite cleanly, it's not irrational to fear something that would subjugate you. No, as a matter of fact, I'm real keen on the lack of subjugation. I'm notorious for my free speech. And by the way, I'm a full-throated proponent of free speech, Dave, because when we lose free speech, all those other nine Bill of Rights things, they're toast. Yeah. Freedom of press, what does that mean without freedom of speech? Freedom of religion, what does that mean without freedom of speech? It is our most precious right, and it disturbs me enormously 
this is where I agree so much with Sad is that the political correctness is destroying our ability to think. Well, this, when we can no longer think as a nation, what do we have left? Well, it's a short step to tyranny. All right, well, let's, uh, let's make this about ourselves then and talk a little bit about the kafirs. So basically, uh, in, according to Islam, the kafirs, it's basically any non-believer, correct? Yes. Now, this has some subtleties to it, but what I'm, you know, for instance, when I was in a debate with a Muslim, I said, let me be very clear. I do not believe Muhammad was the prophet of Allah, and I don't believe, and I believe that the Quran is a derivative work. I said, I claim to be a kafir. And, uh, and by the way, your pronunciation of the word may be right, mine may be wrong. Uh, Every Arab speaker, when they hear me mangle the words, always winces, even if they agree with me. Kafir is <laughs> probably, kafir, I think, is like a probiotic drink, mostly in uh, <laughs> Turkey. So uh, let's make sure that I'm going to go with your pronunciation. Okay. So <laughs> where are we here? I was talking about the kafir. It's, so I'm very clearly a non-believer as a prophet of Allah. Now, there's some middle ground here that, uh, both uh, apologists for Islam and Muslims try to strike, which is to say, oh, now, wait a minute. If you're a Christian or a Jew, then you're people of the book, and we're all members of the family of Abraham. See, we're one big, nice, cozy family. But as with so many things about Islam, read the fine print. And what the fine print says is, is that if you're a Jew and you believe that Muhammad was the final Jewish prophet, then you're a real person of the book. Well, that doesn't, I don't know if any Jews who really qualify for that. And if you're a Christian and you believe that Jesus was not part of the Trinity, was not divine, did not die, was not crucified, was not resurrected, then you're a Christian. Well, I think we've just removed all the Christianity out of Christianity and all the Judaism out of Judaism. And so, but if you meet those criteria, then you're a person of the book. So basically, Hindus, Jews, atheists, agnostics are all Kafirs. Yeah. And it's, so that, that's a problem because, you see, everything that is said about the Kafir is bad. For instance, Allah hates Kafirs. I don't like that. Yeah, that's not good. We're, we're agreed in that. That is, that is not good. So is part of the issue here is just that out of the big three religions, uh, you know, out of the, the three monotheistic religions, uh, Judaism, Catholicism, or Christianity, and Islam, that Islam's just the newest. So by definition, it was allowed to comment on the others, uh, which gives it a certain a certain more new world value or something because it can say, ah, look at that old stuff and how we're going to treat the people in those other ones. Well, it's true. And basically, this is the claim of Islam, is that Allah gave the true revelation to the Jews and the Torah, and they, they changed it in order to obscure the fact that Muhammad was a prophesied prophet. And the original gospel was actually for Jesus to say, the one who comes after me is Muhammad, and he is the one that is anointed. Well... So therefore, they have perfect rear view, view, rear view mirror vision, right. if you will. They can look in the back and say, see, we were that. And we were the real one, but you changed it, you Christians, you Jews. Yeah. So one of the things I find when I discuss religion, and I am not a religious person, uh, but I find that these ideas become political, uh, which is why I end up discussing it a lot, because I do like talking about politics, is that a lot, a lot of my, my friends who I would consider more apologists for religion in general, but specifically for Islam, well, they'll say, you're, you're just focusing on Islam, or they'll say, but they're all, they're all nonsense, or they're all equally bad. Except that's not quite true, right? Because these, these books are derived from different things. So can you just sort of lay out some of the differences in the book specifically that, that lead to actions? Well, let me explain something about the books. Now, by the way, I'm going to stick with uh, Islam here. The thing that is most puzzling about Islam is, is there is good stuff and bad stuff. And so this leads to the question, well, which is real? For instance, there's the verse, you have your religion and I have mine. Let there be no compulsion in religion. Well, that sounds wonderful. That's if pretty that's good. All the, I'm good with that. Yeah. <laughs> if that's all there were in the Quran, I would be like, all right, fine. Uh, you, you have your prayer day on Friday instead of Saturday instead of Sunday, but hey, who cares? Yeah. But instead, we find that that's not quite it, because the kafir is to be actively resisted politically. And it's this active political resistance that bothers me, because this political resistance includes violence, a lot of violence. And so therefore, we, ask, we have to answer this question, well, which one is the real Islam, the good stuff or the bad stuff? The answer is yes. <laughs> right. And no. there, there's an actual word for that, right? Abrogation? I call that dualism. Well, now, there's two. Abrogation is in the Quran. 
But I expand that to even bigger because, you see, not only is the Quran conflicted, so is the Hadith and so is the Sirah. So what I say is Islam is dualistic. It always has two simultaneous views. But now let's discuss abrogation. Yeah. You have your religion, I have mine. That's an early Meccan verse. Then the latter verse is, let uh, like, strike off their heads, where you know, ambush them wherever you find them. That comes later. Now, the Arabs of Muhammad's day were not stupid. They said, Muhammad, last year you said this. This year you're saying that. Uh, what's up? Which one do we believe? Right. So the Quran has three verses which says the latter verse is better than the earlier verse. But listen carefully to what I said. It doesn't say the earlier verse is wrong. So therefore, when Muslims claim Islam is a religion of peace, they're right. It's just that they're half right. The other half is it is the politics of jihad. So therefore, this dualistic thing, which is well, which is the real one, and I like to say the answer is yes, it's both of them. But this gives the Islam an enormous power because it can represent itself as peace at the interfaith gathering. Mm -hmm. But when it times turn to, when it comes time to turn the political screws, then they've got the threatened violence of the pol political actions. Yeah. So this gives Islam its enormous strength because it always has whatever you need, the good or the bad. Right, and then on top of that, so you have this uh, dualism and you have this abrogation, but then on top of that, aren't there verses in the Quran that actually tell the believer that they can lie to non-believers to, to push mm -hmm. their ideology, right? Not so much in the Quran, although Allah is the great deceiver. Imagine that, that's one of your concepts of God is he's a great deceiver. Huh. But instead in the Hadith and the Sirah, we have deception. Let me give you a, uh, one of the most famous hadith, uh, Muhammad. Who will kill Ashraf, who has offended Allah and his prophet? Ashraf was a Jewish poet who wrote a poem that ridiculed Muhammad. I will, Muhammad, but I will need to deceive him. Do I have your permission? Yes, deceive him. Now, this is just one hadith about deception. There's others. So this is one of the things that I find makes me uncomfortable <laughs> if I'm dealing with somebody who has a license to lie. It's sort of like James Bond, you know, it's like double O Muslim. <laughs> I have a license to lie. It's like, you know, but then there's another 12 verses. Let me bring these up, which have to do with deception, but of a very subtle sort. There are 12 verses in the Quran, which say that a Muslim is not truly the, is not the true friend of a Kafir. Now that's harmful because for one thing, our brains are wired for sympathy. But what these 12 verses say is you're not to be sympathetic with the Kafir. Now, listen carefully. You can be friendly. Now, Dave, I just recently bought a car. and I'm not going to uh, upset you when I say I walked onto the lot and suddenly I met a lot of very friendly people. <laughs> How they bizarre. Were, they were not my friends. And I don't mean they were mean to me or anything, but I mean, look, we just met. Right. You're not my friend, but you're very friendly. So Muslims can be friendly, but not truly a friend. Do you see how I'm tying this to deception? Yeah, so that, that's now, really, uh, go ahead. But anyway, but let me say this. Most Muslims know very little about Islam, so the professional engineer at work may actually be your friend because he's not truly Islamic. And see, it, it, it all gets, it's hard to f maneuver your way through the social web here. Yeah, so that's exactly what I was going to ask you. So I know we see all these pew polls on what all people of different faiths believe, and there was the very famous pew poll about what uh, the Islamic world, what Muslim people believe, and it caused a massive, uh, the, the infamous blowout on real time with Bill Maher between Sam Harris and Ben Affleck. I'm sure you know all about that. Um, so how, when you see those numbers, those basic numbers from the pew polls, uh, how are you able to negotiate sort of living in the world? You know what the, the doctrine says. You know what the, these numbers say. These numbers are pretty scary. Now, it's not, necessarily sc scary. it's not necessarily scary with what, there aren't that many Muslims in the United States. There's no reason to believe that any even remote percentage of them are partaking in any of this, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, but it's a scary proposition just to be in all that. Here's the scariest proposition. One of the things I've done is to map out the Islamification of a nation. Let's take Turkey for an example, which used to be Anatolia or Asia Minor. It was Greek and Christian. Mm -hmm. Today it's 99.7% Muslim and only 0.3% three, Christian. Now, here's the bad news. This took centuries. 
That is, Islam uses a calendar while we're using a watch. Hmm. Now, this is very bad because the changes can happen very, very slowly. And if you're not aware of the doctrine, you may not be even aware of the slippery slope we're on here with regards to the implementation of Sharia. And we're already implementing Sharia here in Tennessee schools in our textbooks. So you may say, well, look, it's just one textbook in one class in one grade. Wait, can you, tell, grade. can you unpack that a little bit, what's going on in the textbooks? Sure. Well, let me give you some deep background. Over 25 years ago in California, there was a meeting of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they agreed that one of the best ways to bring Sharia to America was to control the textbook process. One of the things I admire about the Muslim Brotherhood is their shrewdness, their toughness, and their ability to do long-range thinking. Well, we've seen this impact here in Tennessee because last year we saw the first of the new textbooks in what was called human geography, which purports, <clears throat> which purports that Islam is the religion of tolerance, that the golden age in Baghdad was the high point of human history, hmm. that Islam was the first to give women their rights, and it goes on and on and on. Now, some of these things are half true, but not fully understood. For instance, let's take Islam as the first to give women their rights. Well, it also gave the Muslims in jihad the right to the right to rape Kafir women. Mm -hmm. It also gives them to the right to be take part in polygamy, to have wife beating, which is a right within Islam. So it's their right in the sense of Islam gives women their rights, but it does not go ahead and tell you what all those rights include. Yeah, you know, interestingly, I saw a video. I'm 99% sure it was an Al Jazeera video. It was in English, and it was a young woman. A uh, young Muslim woman describing how Islam really led to modern day feminism. Needless to say, need, needless to say the comments on the video uh, were less than enthused on her views on that. But it, but it does go to what you're saying, and there's a connection to the Muslim Brotherhood there, and the way that they're they're sort of using our system against us. It sounds it sounds conspiratorial, and that's why when I've talked about it, people. You know, they they feel weird about it. Like, is there really was there really a meeting 25 years ago to start working on our textbooks and things like that? Uh, but you're you're laying out your case. Well, anyway, I can, I've definitely laid out the case. I've read the textbooks, and I can tell you that it they tell at bo at most half the truth. So I say, look, let me get this straight. I wish that every school would teach the Quran in its entirety. I wish that every school would teach Muhammad in his entirety. That's what I'm for. Look, I'm an educator, and all I do with my books and things is to bring you the full, complete story of Islam, Muhammad, and Allah. So I'm all for education about Islam. As a matter of fact, my whole life is devoted to it, but I want the whole truth. Right. You know, I, I was in a court case one time, and I was an expert witness. I had to swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, because in the law, half a truth is a lie. And so all I want is the whole truth and nothing but the truth in our school system about Islam. Yeah, so let's back up a little bit just to, to the life of Mohammed, because when I think when people, um, when they say, well, they're all equally bad or they're all equally good or they're all equally irrelevant or all of that stuff, I think what they're sort of missing is that the, the actual, the sort of leaders of all of these religions were very different People, oh. if you believe it, right? So just real quick, I mean, let's just go through the big three. I mean, if you were to look at Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, they, they had very different lives, right? Let me, let me summarize Muhammad's life, because I think people are more familiar with Moses and Jesus. Yeah. But let's, let's, let's summarize Muhammad's life in about 60 seconds. Sure. He preached the religion of Islam for 13 years in Mecca. He converted 150 Arabs. Now, he was driven out of Mecca because the Meccans said, look, you've brought us nothing but grief, argumentation, conflict, go, get out of here. So he went to Medina, which was about 150 miles north. Whereupon, and by the way, I'm not making this up, he became a politician and a jihadist. He had 100 acts of jihad in the last nine years of his life. Not 101, not 99, precisely 100. That's one a month. Now, here's the drop bottom line. When he died, Every Arab in the Hejaz, which was Central Arabia, where he worked, was a Muslim. Now, let's review this. The religion of Islam was a failure. The politics and jihad was an overwhelming success. That is the summary of Muhammad's life. But do you see the dualism here? The peaceful preacher and then the violent jihadist. Yeah. Well, which one's the real one, Bill? Yes. Right. So that, that's really fascinating. And it actually goes to something else. 
that I've heard you talk about, which is that in a way that all these religions, they're not all designed to spread equally. Uh, that some religions are very hard to get into and easy to get out. Some are easy to get into and hard to get out. So can you lay out a couple uh, examples of that? Because I think this is really fascinating and it's very obvious and yet it's something that we don't really think about. Well, the, there's, there's, I view some downsides of Islam. If you leave the synagogue, nothing happens other than what happens in your personal relationships. If you leave the church, Nothing happens except what is in your personal relationships. But if you leave Islam, one of several things can happen, all bad. I know one apostate whose parents said, we could kill you, but we will not never, ever contact us again. You are dead to us. That is, she became an apostate. And it is also, the uh, Sharia says, there is no penalty for killing an apostate. Now, notice it doesn't say to kill them. It just says there's no penalty. Mm -hmm. Well, this goes against what I call freedom of consciousness and freedom of religion, and I therefore maintain that Islam does not qualify to be a corporate member of our society if it so directly rejects what I hold as one of our central principles, freedom of religion. Make your choice. I mean, I just gave you a brief summary of my own religious progression. Yeah. I don't want to be gunned down or bombed because at one step or another. So anyway, I dislike the idea that someone can be killed because of their religion. Whatever it is. Yeah, but it's not just the getting out part. It's also the getting in part that's easy, right? So I've heard you talk well, about this. It's very easy to get in. Right. Just repeat in Arabic, there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is his prophet. And you say it in Arabic. Turns out Allah only understands Arabic, I guess, <laughs> which is kind of odd. And then you're a Muslim. I won't ask but you to do it in Arabic then. <laughs> it's very easy to get in, but it's impossible to get out. It's like those... Uh, when you're at the airport parking and they tell you when you drive in, do not back yeah. up because those tiger teeth come up. So Islam is kind of like those gates that we see at the airport where you get the rental car. Yeah, it sounds like Hotel California. It's easy to get Oh, in. yes, you can check out any time you want, but you can never leave. Exactly. One of the great lines in rock and roll, by the way. There you go. Uh, I think we just got our promo for the episode. Um, <laughs> so, but, okay, so when you take that concept, other religions it's very hard to get in, right? So I really, I'm just really trying to lay out these real distinctions. Other religions, you can't just say uh, whatever it is in Arab, in that language and get in, right? Mm-hmm, that's just, that's the Shahada. Yeah. So, you know, instead of doing comparative religion, although we can continue to do this, sure. I would like to more compare it to our political ideas. Okay. But yes, you're quite right. Uh, and for instance, Judaism is notoriously hard to get into. I mean, they really say, you sure you wanna do this now? <laughs> <laughs> right. Christians are much more big because they see themselves as having a more universal charter. But we need to understand that Islam's charter is, I will wage war until every kafir admits there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. That's a forecast for the future. I will wage war until, well, when does that stop? Well, when we're all, when there's no more kafirs, that's exactly what it says.